bringing you in-depth discussion from one of the rad groups of online writers covering the Edmonton Oilers. Are you ready for Oilers Overtime? Oilers. Join us as we talk news, rumors, trades, player grades, game results, and more. All featured on one of the most glorified teams in the NHL. From the great one to the next one. From the boys on the bus to the decade of darkness. This is Oilers Overtime. Hey there, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome back to another edition of THW Oilers Overtime. My name is Jim Parsons here with the Hockey Raiders. We got everybody with us this week. Uh, we had a few schedule mix up, which is why we're doing it one day later than we normally would. But we also wanted to watch the hockey game, which was unfortunately not a very good hockey game for the Edmonton Oilers. But we'll get into that in a second here. Uh, Colton Pankey's with us. Colton, how are you? Good, Jim. Good. Excited to get going. Yeah, right on. Uh, Julian Mangelo is with us, too. Uh, Julian, how are you, bud? Doing good. Eight games left. So we're down to the final stretch before playoffs. So it's exciting. That's right. As long as they're not all like the game against Minnesota <laughs> and Brian Swain is with us too. Brian, how you doing, bud? Doing good, Jim. Good. All right. So we're going to talk uh, a little bit about the Minnesota wild game. Uh, we would be remiss if we don't, even though it's not a pleasant conversation because they got owned pretty good. Like the Minnesota wild. Now they outshot Minnesota, I think, mm -hmm. but the scoreboard or the score sh shotting, just whatever the words I'm looking for here, the shot totals didn't reflect the game at all. To me, I watched that game and I thought, man, Minnesota outworked, outhounded, out forechecked, out hit everybody except maybe Evander Kane, right? He's the only guy that really sort of showed up physically in that game. Uh, Colton, what did you make of the, what was it, a 5 1 loss? Is that what the, the final score was? What did you think of that game? Yeah, I mean, you pretty much touched on it. I think uh, just from the get go, it really wasn't going their way. I think Minnesota's a pretty good team. I, they don't really get a lot of credit this season, but. They're having a really good year, but yeah, I just thought they looked flat from the get go. You seen Woodcroft called the timeout there. I think when it was four nothing to kind of try and get a spark in them, and it really just didn't seem to do much. Still, they just had nothing going. Uh, really, I can't think of anyone that. I mean, McDavid had a good first twenty, but outside of that, there wasn't a lot of positives to take from it. There were a couple moments of some sustained pressure from that first line. Uh, they weren't able to capitalize on it, but there were moments in the first two periods where they're kind of like, okay, well, these guys are getting some ch some chances here and opportunities and things like that. Uh, Julian, was this a game that sort of reflects the fact that maybe Minnesota is a bad matchup for the Oilers, or was this more of an Oilers team just didn't really have it? I think they exhausted all their energy from the game before when they played Colorado because they fired almost everything they had at at the avalanche and Kemper came up big for them and they played a really good game there. So I guess you could say you can kind of expect maybe a little bit of a downfall after such a high intensity and emotional game, uh, the, the game before um, I'm more of a, you know, you kind of, the effort wasn't there. They were flat coming out of the gate uh, for most of the game, actually. So I'm kind of of the mindset that you just kind of flush it. They won five in a row prior to the loss against Colorado. So, you know, it couldn't have, kept going for, for much longer. So you got to come back down at some point. So um, they've been playing good over the last couple of weeks. So I don't think you can complain too much. You would like to see a little bit of a better effort or a little bit more emotion um, from all the, uh, the group rather than just the one guy, like you said, in Evander Kane. Um, but other than that, I think they're, they're kind of locked into their playoff spot and maybe that kind of has something to do with it too, where they're just kind of uh, not locked in that. Well, they're locked into a playoff spot, a little bit of shuffling that could still go on obviously, but um I think they're in a good position and I just think that they kind of flush it and keep moving forward. Yeah. I mean, they have had a good uh, habit this season of being able to bounce back from a crappy loss. Like they played against Calgary and got wiped. They responded really well. They've done it in the past. Uh, I will ask before I move over to Brian, this was one of the few games, Julian, where the Oilers had an extra day to practice, right? It's not very often that it's happened this season. Do you think that helped them or hurt them? I mean, I guess you could argue both, but I think at this point in the season, I think it's better to kind of give them that little bit of rest, maybe that where, you know, you're, you're eight games left to the end of the season. So I think it may have helped or, or, or may have hurt them because they're not maybe used to it. Um, but I think in the long run, it's more beneficial, especially heading in dry settle kind of still looks a little bit banged up. Maybe he's not playing to his, to his full capabilities yet only the one goal before that two games pointless. So um, I think, I think a little bit of TLC and some rest goal goes a long way this time of year. So I think it would have been, it's good for them in the long run, but I think it kind of hurt them because they got out of that rhythm. Brian, I had asked Julian, if he thought the Minnesota wild were a bad matchup, did you get that sense watching this game? It was kind of one of those, 
they play a style that the Oilers haven't seen a lot this season. And I don't know that they handled it very well. They didn't had trouble getting out of their own zone. They, they really just couldn't, once they got into the offensive zone and got a little pressure going on the four check, they seemed to be okay, but it was everything else. It was getting out of their own zone. It was flying through the neutral zone. It was making passes that they couldn't complete because Minnesota just trapped things and shut things yep. down. Is, is this a problem? If the Oilers end up playing Minnesota is another team like a St. Louis blues, who play a lot like the Minnesota Wild do, would those teams be problematic for the Oilers, do you think? The, the Wild are a terrible matchup for all the reasons you just said, Jim. And, I mean, the evidence is there. It wasn't just last night. They lost 7-3-4-1 and four, one earlier this season to them, too, both at, both at home. I mean, they've been owned by the Wild this season, if we're going to be honest about it. Uh, so, yeah, I think that that kind of team, and, and you touched on, like, the, St. Louis as an example, too, does present a problem for the Oilers. And I don't know if – you know, with eight games left in the season and past the trade deadline and all that, if there's any kind of magic thing that can be done to suddenly make them capable of, of you know, being that much better equipped to face a team like this. But having said that, if, if they face Minnesota or St. Louis, it's going to be in the conference finals too. And I think we'll all right. happily mm-hmm. take it if this team so makes it to the conference finals. Uh, you know, if they get that far, then who cares who they're playing, right? That, that, that's a good run. You might be feeling a lot different at that point in this, uh, of, about your, you know, your confidence and, and who knows w- what happens with injuries. But if you're at making it to that point, I think you feel really good about your game going there. Well, I also got to wonder if the fact that you're playing in a round of playoff hockey, which is just naturally more physical and beating on you and whatever, if that, you know, sort of calluses the Oilers, thickens the skin a little bit, right? If they're able to get through that first round and they go, okay, well, that was way more physical and way more tough than we figured it would be. Now we're, we're ready. We know what to expect. So they maybe approach a team like Minnesota or St. Louis a little differently. I think they need that, right? They got to have that experience. I think when this team finally breaks through, this current group, and I'm not really counting 2017 uh, run and this part of this when I say it, but this group has to have that breakthrough series when they survive that and they win that and they go on and and then, you know, they see what it takes to get to the next next step. I, I think, too, yesterday they were kind of like overplaying, like they were brain farting at some points where they were overplaying the puck and it kind of ended up in their own zone. They when they When they get beat up the way they do on the scoreboard in games like that, I noticed that they allow the teams to cut through the middle pretty easily and they, they're usually pretty good. And when they win, they, they, they prevent that from happening. When teams yeah. can get into the slot like that and get those chances where Koskinen, you know, he's moving one way and the puck's going the other. So when there, there was a couple of goals actually that game where they were cutting right across the crease and letting something go. Uh, and, and I think it was a little bit of defensive meltdowns and, and little brain farts that kind of just led to turnovers that were unnecessary. And they almost shot themselves in the foot really. Golden, did you see that game uh, towards the end as a game where maybe the Oilers, who knew they weren't going to win, they weren't going to come back and, and make a run? Now, yeah, they're a team that could score three goals quickly, but you kind of know going into the third, you're pretty much out of it. Like you said, they called the timeout and it didn't seem to do anything. Um, is that a game where you maybe you can send a different statement? You know, maybe you can get down and dirty, maybe get a little nasty, uh, do what Evander Kane did. Now, he was, and I think, in my opinion, coming to the aid of Kyler Yamamoto but he went right after Kirill Kaprizov, right? The star of the team. And that's one of the things that we talk about with the Oilers that they don't tend to do that very much. If they're going to attack Connor McDavid or they're going to attack Leon Dreisaitl, the best thing you can do is attack their stars. And that's what Evander Kane did. Now, do you get the sense that maybe the Oilers should have done more of that? As this was a game, you say, okay, let's send a message. You know, like you guys think you're tough. We think we're tough too. Um, don't necessarily want to say you're dropping gloves with everybody, but Kane kind of, I don't necessarily believe Hartman when he says, oh, nobody came to his defense because the Oilers were in there. But Kane was ready to take on that entire line by himself. Like, what did you make of that scrum at the end of the game? Uh, Were you a little disappointed? Were you pleased to see the Oilers get like, how did you watch and take that all in? No, I I like that. I think that's kind of when you get worried is if there's no emotion like that, then it's kind of that's when you have teams, I think, kind of checking out. But at the same time, there's a fine line like to go after stars and stuff like we kind of seen that situation with Jay Beagle and uh, Trevor Zegers, Troy Terry, like a week or so ago. You don't want to see stuff like that. But I think Kane at the end of the game there just to show emotion, show that they're not happy with this. They're not willing to be pushed around all that. I think that's great. And I think that's kind of what they're missing before bringing him in, because like we've talked about before, Cassian's kind of been inconsistent with that the past few seasons. So I think just showing that heart and showing that they're not happy with last night's result is a good thing. Yeah, that's what I saw when I saw that fight. It was one, and and when I say go after the stars, I don't mean like deck them, like Beagle deck uh, Trevor's eagers. But what I'm saying is like, make them know you're there. 
right? Don't give them free passes to skate around and do what they do. Uh, let them know that you're there. But what I watched when I saw that and then Kane got the 10-minute misconduct was I'm thinking this is a really good opportunity for Zach Cassian to step up and send a message to his coach and say, okay, if Andrew Kane can do it, but so can I. And even if I'm not scoring, because he hasn't scored in like 20 games or something, that he could have hit some people. He could have gone and roughed some people up. He could have done something, right? The, the game's over at that point. The Oilers are not winning. So why not say, hey, Woodcroft, look, at I will do this for us, right? He didn't do it. So I don't know what that means, but I was really happy with the way Evander Kane got in there and didn't seem to care uh, too much. Uh, Julian, did you think that uh, those penalties were correctly dished out? What did you think of Hartman's comments at the end when he's like, yeah, nobody wants to go to and defend Evander Kane. They're yeah. Right. I mean, I, I guess you're just trying to pile onto a bad situation for Evander Kane from earlier in the season. I think that you're just trying to attack his character, but I think he's been a real good fit here. And I think he's proved that, who, who he, he actually is and he's not actually as bad as the media maybe made it out to be um you know i like that he kind of went in there and that's what he's gonna do and it, like you said like cassian's in the lineup to go and hit people and and make a physical impact especially with the playoffs right around the corner and he didn't do that so it's puzzling to see that you know evander kane who's you know scoring almost out of 20 you know almost got 20 goals out of what 40 games played maybe half the season yeah. he's already at 20 so like, you know, a goal scorer like that is the only one that's kind of mucking it up and, and trying to wreak havoc. But, you know, you need more from that, especially going into the playoffs and you need a, a guy who's going to, going to run around and set the tone and, and Evander Kane can't be the only one doing it. Brian, before we move on to the next comment or the next topic, I'll give you this one. Did you catch dry settles comments about, I wouldn't want to play us in the playoffs. Was that just bad timing? Was that unrelated to the game and their performance against Minnesota? What do you, what did you make of that? Um, I thought it was interesting. I thought it was interesting for him to come out. You know, you, you want, you want to believe that. Uh, I think every good team believes that teams that win, believe they're going to win. Um, and I just thought it was interesting that he, you know, wasn't, wasn't afraid to come out there and put that out there and say that that puts a bit of pressure on yourself. That puts a bit of pressure, puts a lot of pressure on your team. Um, so I like that mind mindset. Now, obviously the timing wasn't great when you go out the, a few hours later and get smoked five one, but, um, I like that. I, I hope I like that confidence and I hope it's not misplaced confidence in the sense that it's, I hope it's, I hope it's self-belief and not cockiness. You know what I mean by that? Like yes. it's like, like it's, it's, it's going out there and knowing mm -hmm. we could do this, but we have a, raw, to do a raw, raw type thing, not a look at us type thing. Well, yeah, it's it's like it's not like a, we just go out there and we're going to win, but it's like yeah. if we go out there and do what we do, we mm -hmm. win. Yeah, and he did say that in that full interview, and really the quote was just, you know, "I wouldn't want to play us or yeah, play the, the, the first not, round." And, like but he had talked about how good their defense had been and how they were shutting like that they needed to play that style, not just go out there and try to outscore yeah. everybody. But they needed it. so a lot of that was misplaced when people were quoting it, but. Um, the yeah, headline the is, is that no one wants to play us. If you actually just take three minutes and watch the whole interview. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right, let's switch gears a little bit, Cole, and I'll talk to you. There's been a lot of uh, comments this week and the last few days about Jesse Pugliarvi and how he does almost everything wonderfully except score. He's now, he's missed some time. If you were to you know put him on pace for an 82 game, he'd be all right, but he's not finishing a lot of his golden grade a scoring chances um but he's his underlying numbers are great he tilts the ice towards the offense instead of the defense he shuts down a lot of stuff he's good with Connor mcdavid whose numbers are better when he's with them um but there's still this underlying whatever that pooley rv might not be um his you know his individual parts aren't as good as the sum of what he should be so what do you make of pooley rv and the fact that he hasn't scored much um but he's still being viewed by you know the analytics community as a heck of a player yeah so i'm kind of i kind of split on this one because i'm a i'm a big puliari fan i think he's just just from a personality standpoint he's he's extremely likable and then he's really had a pretty good season he was even pretty good last season um but at the same time like i see a lot of these things like these expected goals and everything for people defending him and it's like that's great but at the end of the day expected goals aren't that's goals just, like yeah. he's he there's only like I don't know, like everything they're seeing on the sheet of paper, they're arguing people who are saying that he's not producing points as if it doesn't matter. But at the end of the day, it does matter. Like scoring goals is what wins you games. So I, I 
do hope they keep him around. I know there's been some talk that he could be moved in the offseason. I don't think that's the right call, but I think all these people like just constantly praising and kind of almost getting on anyone that has called him out for not producing like he hasn't. I think they're kind of out of line because he is playing with McDavid and he needs to start like these expected goals too. Like maybe it says something about the fact he has all these chances, but just isn't finishing like that might say something about him as well, that he just doesn't have that finishing touch. So there's quite a bit to unpack from it, but I I do think that he needs to be better offensively if he is going to keep playing with McDavid. Yeah, and I, I wrote an article uh, not long ago actually suggesting it was a strange point of view for me to come from, but I said he might be better for the Oilers long term if he doesn't score. And what I meant when I wrote that was, one, that he's doing all of the things to help his line mates score. He's getting assists. He's getting on the four check. He's digging up pucks and getting them to the great guy. He's doing all the things that people are saying that he's doing, but he's still showing up on the score sheet because he's getting assists and things like that. Uh, which he hasn't really been doing. And I also said in the article that he needs to score every once in a while. It's not like he needs to score, you know, once or twice, you know, a game. He just needs to pot the odd one and keep doing everything else that he's doing. But he isn't. He's not He's not putting that in there. Is this concerning, Julian? Do you think this is the player who is going to figure it out, that he'll just go on a run real quick and in three games he'll have three or four goals and we'll all be like, oh, yeah, it was bound to come. It just was – he was snake bitten. Well, I agree with Colton. Everything Colton said is kind of bang on just because at the end of the day, you need to see points. Like you're playing on the top line. You're this is you need to produce as, as a top line. Like I, I compare it to Leafs, you know, Bunting's on the top line. He's produced, even if he's not that skillful of a player, he's produced points. And that's what you're asking. When you're playing with elite two superstar players, you need to produce points, whether that's just getting them the puck and letting them do all the work. You got to get those points. But um, you know, the, the goals, I, I, he is a very streaky player. I think that once he gets one, he gets a couple. Um, so I think that, you know, he's still working through that finishing touch. Like Colton was saying, he still needs to find that in him. And I guess you can argue for and against that. That's what's missing. It's imagine he can get the finishing touch or find it, or he's just snake bitten right now. So wait till it comes around again type thing. So I guess it kind of goes both ways, but, um, if, if you're heading into the playoffs, you need every line going and you need contributions from everybody. So I think that if you're going to be wanting those minutes and playing those big minutes, you're going to have to be held to that standard. And that means that you're going to have to do better than the four points you have in the last 12 games. So Brian, do you think the analyst community is arguing here that pool Yarvi will start to produce or are they arguing it doesn't matter because his, his numbers in every other category are so good that really we should overlook the fact that he isn't scoring. What do you think they're making the argument for here? Cause it's very polarizing, right? There's people who watch the scoreboard and don't see his name anywhere and go, man, take him off that line. And then there's other people like, no, you got to keep him there. Cause he's the reason that line in a way is so good. So what do you think that community, the analytics underlying number of people are saying? Probably not the right person to ask that question. Uh, no, just I'm, a general, more- I'm just asking for a general gut reaction because most of what we see here is gray, right? It's never black and white, even though people love to make it out to be. The analytics people always say it's all numbers. And the people who watch the game say the numbers don't matter. It's just (laughs) what happens on the score sheet. It's really a gray area. The truth is somewhere in the middle, right? So if you have a gut reaction to what you're hearing both people argue, what do you think they're saying? That he's going to get these numbers eventually or that it doesn't matter? I mean, I guess that would be the argument, right? Is that he's going to eventually produce. I I don't know. I my whole take on this is I think Colton summed it up perfectly there. Expected goals are not goals. That's and it. it's, it comes down to that. Um, uh, but I don't know. I mean, he's the other point Colton made that was good too, is that what maybe it says something about him that there are all these expected goals and he's not converting. So I, I don't know. I mean, I'm just, yeah, I, what the argument is, you're, you're right. It, it's, it's very divisive, Jim. And it's, this is, he suddenly turned into one of the most, um, polarizing figures in you know in quite a while in Edmonton and there's been a few of them and it's like people there you know there's people on either side that's uh it's 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 all in one way or the other with this guy and I think um, I think though the problem is is that like we haven't seen it fully every season he's been here well he's never been consistent exactly right like it's there's always that missing link or something that falls off or whether it's his play or an injury or something that is affecting what what we wish and hope he becomes to what he actually is, and I think that that's where the division is. Yeah, that's at some that. point, 
at some point, the production has to catch up to the potential. Mm-hmm. And like, how long do you wait before before, before you, you make a move or have to yeah make a decision basically on what you're going to do with it? Yeah. All right. So I got two takeaways from that conversation. One, expected goals are not goals. <laughs> and two, if there was a Molson Cup three-star selection, Colton would get the first star. Is that what I'm getting from this? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So now we've talked a little bit about Evander Kane. We've talked a little bit about Jesse Pugliarvi. Let's mix the two together because there's a lot of conversation today. Some rumors. Alan Mitchell, low tide. He had said that he's hearing from uh, guys closest to the team. Uh, he didn't mention names, but we can probably all assume who he's talking about when he says these guys have been in the media and click connected to those for like 40 years. So we probably know what media guys he's talking about. And there was talk on Oilers now with Bob Stoffer that there's maybe some talk that maybe Evander Kane's the guy. And Pooley not the guy. So my question for you guys, and we'll go around, is if you have to make a choice, if you're looking at a long-term extension for Evander Kane, we'll just throw out a number. I have no idea what the number will be, but Stoffer says it's going to be in the 5 million. So let's just say that Evander Kane is 4 by 5 and Pooley RV is 5 by 4 That's what you're probably looking at. So who do you take, Colton? If you can only take one and you can't have both because we know they need a goaltender, when they need to probably improve their blue line a little bit. They need to get Yamamoto done. They need to get Ryan McLeod done in the next little bit. Like there's all these things. If you have the choice between the two, who are you taking? If you're Ken Holland. It's, it's so tough. Cause I mean, like we've said, Kane's just fit in perfectly here, but obviously we know there is some, I guess, risk with signing him long-term just with what we've seen behavior wise in the past. Um, but at the same time, then with Pooley RV, there's the inconsistencies and whatnot. I, I think even just given the extra million dollars, I'd be kind of more willing to go with Pooley RV just because it frees up even just a little bit more cap room, which even we know even just a little bit is huge for this team right now. And I think just the untapped potential still, he's still young at 23. I think there's more upside there in bringing him back. But having said that, I like I don't envy being in Holland's position if he has to choose between one or the other because Kane's been fantastic and it's tough to let him just walk. But I think you look at it as he was a really cheap kind of rental player, if that is the case, and maybe just say thank you and let him walk and then use that extra million dollars or whatever you do have to improve other areas, whether it be goaltending or on the blue line. So I think I would probably go with Pugliari, but it's not an easy choice. Okay, so we got a close one, but we got one for Pugliari so far. Uh, Julian, where do you sit? Are you Evander Kane corner or Jesse Pugliari corner? Um, to end, end basically at the end of the argument, I'm going to say it's going to be Pugliarvi if, if the scenario you're giving is that it's a 5x5 five five for Kane and a 5x4 four, uh, five four for Pugliarvi just because it comes down to the dollars for me and having to spend that money elsewhere. Um, and you're you're hoping that Pugliarvi becomes a cheap a cheaper version of what Evander Kane is providing right now. Um, and I think that that's what you're hoping his potential can get to. Uh, in terms of if it was even... Uh, salary term is, is is right across. I would I would pick Evander Kane. I think just because of the more of the the you know what you're getting. There's consist- consistency there that you've you've seen from him in a short period of time, and he has a track record where Puliarvi doesn't. And the Oilers are in win now mode, and it's about produ- production, straight production right now. And you need the numbers. So if it was straight even salary term, I'm going Evander Kane. Um, but because of the age difference and, and that extra million dollars in the scenario we have here, um, if that ends up being the case, then I'm going to say it's Pooley RV. And the only reason that I'm saying the terms I'm saying is I'm looking at it from the Oilers point of view and that you want to, if you're going to give Pooley RV any sort of a long-term deal, you want to buy as many years of unrestricted free agency sure. as you can and get it the best deal you can when you can get it. Uh, and I'm only suggesting five years because that takes Evander Kane to the age of 36. Yeah. And I can't imagine any other team's going to give him more than that. So no way. Uh, that's why I'm thinking that. Um, Brian, where do you sit? Are you thinking Evander Kane? Are you thinking Pooley Arvey if you have to choose one? Uh, I think even regardless, I mean, if if the money is fairly close, even I, I'm going Pooley Arvey and it's just because I don't trust Kane yet. Um, we've said this from day one that when he came in here, this was a prove it contract for him. I, I don't, I'm not confident that if he, you know, suddenly if, if at the end of the season, he signs five years that we're going to see this out of him and that you can trust him not only to deliver on the ice, cause you can probably trust him more with that, but to continue to walk the fine line and, you know, keep his nose clean as he has, because he has been a model citizen and teammate and all that good stuff since he got, got here. So uh, I, I don't necessarily trust him into that. Maybe that's not fair, but 
um, his track record speaks for itself. You know, he's going to be, we're, we're, he's practically 10 years old. I mean, what is he, 30, 31? 31. So, 30. 31. Yeah, so 30. Puyarvi's 23, he's 31. There's almost an eight-year difference. Puyarvi, over the course of this five-year contract, is going to be heading into his prime years. There's The potential for him to improve is there. Uh, Kane has probably hit his peak, mm-hmm. or he's not going to get better. Um, and I think even if Puyarvi doesn't work out, there's he's a better trade asset. Like if either, if, let's say, Looking at worst case scenario, if 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 they both go south during the course of this deal, if it just doesn't work out, I think Bouyarvi is, is is more tradable than Kane is. I think if you sign Kane and he, and it doesn't work out for whatever reason, the only way that. you're getting getting rid of him is if you're going to be able to uh, void his contract like like uh, San Jose did because there ain't nobody taking that on. If, yeah, or if, give a pretty pick. Yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. And, and they don't need to be given up any more of those. Yeah. So that's so I, you know, for all reasons above money, not even not not even to do with it. Got to go pull your. Yeah, I'm I'm going to vote pull your as well. I think you guys all know how much of a pull your fan I am. Um, I do like Evander Kane and everything he's brought to the season, but I see him if he's willing to do like three years, I would do it. But I don't think he is. I think he's probably a player that's looking to cash in on how great this last few games of the season has been. Maybe that changes. Cause he's like, man, there were a lot of teams that didn't want me and Edmonton did. And there's, there's uh, chemistry here. Uh, McDavid. I really like McDavid likes me. Maybe he says all those things. And if that's the case, then okay. But uh, five years to me, more than the off ice issues that could potentially be there. I worry about what happens with his game at 33 and 34 right so and what's if, the max contract you would be willing to give kane then in terms of where he would be like if you're saying five years is too much what's the right amount that you're three, three like, by three five years three by five i go three by five and i move other pieces and, and i try I, to keep I, I think, and Yamamoto. i'm on board with that and i think maybe a guy like fogel is a guy you can move if you're playing him where you are in the lineup get a deal done there and whatever you, you cut your losses with the, that, that one for one trade as it is. And you know what, right now, Vander Kane's more valuable to you than Fogel's going to be in same with that money. Yeah. You, and if I have to, and I, I've been in the corner of Tyson Berry more than a lot of people, I moved Cassie and I moved yep. Tyson Berry. hundred percent. Right? Cassian is shown already. He's not going to do it. He's just not at least consistent. He's going to give you a two out of 10 games, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, you can probably find a sucker team that'll take it like they took a Ryan Reeves or something. Some team is going to go, you know what? Yeah, we could use a Cassian and they're going to have money and Seattle. They'll, they'll be able to move them, right? Uh, same with Tyson Berry. I firmly believe that there's a team out there that thinks he's a top four defenseman who can run their court, their part, their power play. And they always have that in Evan Bouchard. We watched Minnesota. Evan Bouchard wasn't perfect, but it's going to happen with young players. He's going to figure it out. My biggest concern for Puyarvi, if you move him, is what you gave away when he figures it out, right? That Because I think he will. I, I'm such a big fan of him that I, I do believe that, even though it hasn't all come together yet, that it will. And at that point, Julian, when you talk about you need to win now, I think it'll happen sooner than later. I think it could happen in the playoffs this year. I think it could happen at the beginning of next season. If that's what happens and Puyarvi all of a sudden clicks, and figures out how to get 25 to 30 goals a season, you give that away because I don't trust Holland to get a good value for him if they trade him. Right. So then what are you what are you doing? You're like, yeah. man, we just gave away Paul Yarby. And like to Brian's point, if you trade Evander Kane, you can always say, well, we just didn't want, we didn't feel like we could take the gamble that it was all going to pay off over a five or four or five year term. Right. Mm-hmm. And you can always just say, you know what? It is what it is. He yeah, we, we, got, we got our yeah. We tried to win when we got him as a rental. It didn't pan out. Good yeah. luck somewhere else, right? I just don't know that you want to give Pugliarv away. He could turn out to be not what we all think he's going to be. Uh, but I, I would rather risk it and try to get Pugliarv at a decent number that when you look at it two or three years from now, go, man, that was a good deal, right? I don't think you're ever going to get that with Evander Kane. At best, you're looking at you're getting the value that you paid for him for four or five years. You're probably not even going to get that. So for me, that's that's why I vote Pugliarv, but... It's close. All right. Uh, to finish things off, Colton, let's do a plus one, minus one uh, for the week or the games or whatever you want to do. Uh, do you have a plus one or a minus one for the Oilers? Uh, I'll go minus one to the Duncan Keith at the Bouchard pairing. Last night just, it was a, a pretty rough showing for them. I'm confident that they'll bounce back, but last night was just a, a pretty ugly game for them, especially on that first goal that gave away by Keith there. So I'll give it to them. <laughs> yeah. That's, unfortunately, you, you look at Keith and that, 
that happens and everybody's like, yep, see, I told you. Look at Keith, <laughs> yeah. right? And when they give Bouchard a little pass, they're kind of like, you know what? He's going to make mistakes when he's young. It's just the the luxury of being young and the uh, you can't afford to be making mistakes when you're a veteran like Duncan Keith. Uh, Julian, what did you think? Plus one, minus one. Um, I'll go I'll go to start off. I'll go a minus one for Fender Kane's uh, ex-wife's little Venmo to Hartman there to help pay his fine. I think from an entertainment standpoint, and it's like the WWE script. Someone's writing the script for the NHL right now and all this stuff that's going on. But um, I think that was just a un, unmoral type of move to make and kind of unnecessary. So I didn't like that much, but I like, uh, I'll give a plus one to Mike Smith. I think he's been pretty good and uh, pretty stabilizing. So I think I, I'm not sure who's going to start in the playoffs. I, I would assume it'd be Koskinen, but I like Smith's experience. And if he's headed in playing the way he is now, he could be, could steal the net back. Uh, Brian, what about you? I didn't catch the Evander Kane's Venmo. Oh, you didn't see that? No, I didn't see that. <laughs> That's interesting. Ba- yeah, basically, yeah. She she set up like 200 bucks to Ryan Hartman to help pay his fine. 200 yeah. bucks. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, the fines are laughable, but 200 bucks. It's like, yeah, I know. But so just Kane's that, that, like, that so I'm paying my own pocket money for this. Yeah, the type of pettiness is just, you know, beyond me. Yeah, crazy. Brian, what did you think? Plus one, minus one. I'll go plus one to uh, one of the top prospects, Carter Savoy, who won the Frozen Four with the University of Denver. He's had a heck of a season. And and I, what I really like about him is he's he's had – we know he's got potential. Like, he's been a huge scorer now for two years in NCAA. But one of the knocks on him, I think, has kind of been just he maybe doesn't have the maturity. And he was he was uh, on uh, the Jason Greger show about a few weeks ago talking about whether he was going to turn pro, and he talked about maybe not turning pro just yet because he felt he had more personal growth to do, that he had really grown up personally while he was in college. And, and so I just thought that spoke volumes about where he is now. I don't know if he's going to sign this offseason and if he's going to be in Bakersfield next year, where he'll be next year if he's back in the University of Denver. But I think that we're seeing the, this, this kid is just like he's, he's growing up He's growing up as a person, and we already know he had the ability. So I think there's something special on the on the way here for the others. It may not get there for two or three years yet, but but I really like what's coming down the pipeline with him. Yeah, they've picked up a couple uh, decent additions. I mean, Savoy was in their system already, but Ginfanti and Goal and other things like that. Like they've done some good work in the last little bit. So many college guys are going off to so many teams, and Myers went to Colorado today. Talk about the rich getting richer. Um, yeah, I'm with you. I think that was a good good signing by them. Good tryout for the HL, and we'll see where it goes. But um, I'm going to give my plus one to Warren Fogel because he never gets enough love. And he scored a couple times in the last few games here. He's been a little more dogged on the on the puck. He hasn't always finished, and he's been one of those guys that we like to whip on this season because um, he has not necessarily produced at the level we sort of thought he would. Uh, but he's been better um, of late, and they need him to start to do some stuff here as they get into the playoffs. He doesn't necessarily have to score all the time. He doesn't have to get two goals in two games, and I'm not asking for that. But just the ability to show that he can pot one every once in a while, and his chemistry with Ryan Nugent Hopkins has been helpful. Uh, the two guys have played pretty well together, so uh, I'm going to give him a little love because we don't often give him much love. And so uh, while I'm with Julian on the idea that maybe he's a guy you move in the offseason if you need to free up some money, while he's playing well, I'm going to give him credit for doing so because I think he uh, – he doesn't get enough love, and every once in a while, he puts a couple goals in, which kind of keeps us going. Oh, yeah, okay. Warren Frogel yeah. can be. And helpful. they're going to need him. They're going to need him, right? Yep. Yeah, absolutely. All right, guys. Well, that's that's a, a good show this week. We'll leave it at that. Uh, for everybody else who's been watching, I appreciate you guys tuning in. Uh, don't forget to uh, hit the like button on Facebook or subscribe on YouTube if this is where you're watching things. Um, for Jim, Julian, Colton, Brian, myself, uh, the Hockey Raiders, Thank you for joining us for THW Oilers Overtime, and we will probably talk to you guys next week.